Welcome to the STEM Sessions podcast. I am your host, Cody Colborn. In this episode, I discuss the increased use of science to get clicks on YouTube, and I volley some criticism towards the people doing it, especially those deemed to be science communicators. To be clear, I'm not talking about actual experts, either by education or experience, who share their knowledge. That's a new form of teaching that I happen to enjoy. Instead, I'm talking about people injecting science into their videos to set themselves apart and boost their perceived expertise on the subject at hand. That's not a good thing, because they so often apply science and engineering irrelevantly, or incorrectly, or unnecessarily, which I feel is a net negative to their viewers. Now, for the record, I don't consider myself a science communicator, lest you think I'm being a hypocrite. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I know my areas of expertise. And while I like learning outside my expertise and sharing what I've learned, I always make it very clear I'm not an expert and ask you to confirm everything that I say. All that said, let's start off the year with a bit of ranting. And with apologies to Dave Mustaine of Megadeth, this is the STEM Sessions Podcast, Episode 26. STEM Cells! And we're buy-in stem cells, and we're buy-in! Injecting science into arguments on the internet has always been a way of making the author sound smarter or carry more authority. On one extreme, we have a subset of edge lords that I like to call stem lords, and they did this frequently to rile people up, especially in arguments of religion and politics. They know just enough to make themselves sound smart and claim victory by pointing out their target's logical fallacies. Their less aggressive counterparts are followers of ideas that are uh, politely categorized as pseudoscience, such as flat earth, free energy, and cryptozoology. And they apply a sort of scientific process to their arguments and observations to give them a perceived academic credibility. Now, on the other extreme, and perhaps in reaction to the successful public relation campaigns of those pseudoscience circles, people who actually work in the science fields entered the fray. An early example is found in 2008 when Dr. Stephen Novella and Dr. David Gorski popularized the term science-based medicine. And according to their About section, science-based medicine was started because, quote, Online information about alternative medicine is overwhelmingly credulous and uncritical, unquote, which I guess leads to confusion and uninformed consumer decision making. Then more and more academics and professionals recently joined in, uh, especially since the COVID pandemic seemingly bolstered the perceived authority behind the term science. You see this a lot in the fitness realm of YouTube with sports medicine scientists countering the get ripped in only seven minutes a day gurus. You also see this in areas like archaeology, linguistics, and psychology. I mean, a good example would be someone like Dr. Jackson Crawford and his videos on Indo-European languages and Norse mythology. Those are true experts in their field, and, and while they are ultimately selling a product such as books or classes, or themselves, they're still experts with professional and academic integrity, so I'm less critical of their teachings. But then we have a category of authors that exists kind of between those two extremes. They're neither experts in STEM nor con men. They're the layperson who has carved out a niche on YouTube and now injects science to get more audience attention. They use science as clickbait, essentially. And that's the category I want to discuss further. Science sells in the YouTube algorithm, at least until it's inevitably tweaked in the near future, so I don't blame these authors for trying to stand out. Most of them think that they're legitimately using science to add value to their topics, but the issue is the science they use is frequently incomplete or irrelevant or sometimes wrong, again, not from a malicious intent. It's especially nails on the chalkboard for me when the person who does this is a science communicator of some renown because you would think such a person would know better. The first example I see is outdoor gear reviewers. Now, hiking, camping, and backpacking are big hobbies of mine, 
and I also like to collect gear, much to the dismay of my closets, garage, and bank accounts. So I watch a lot of gear review channels on YouTube. It used to be about how the gear feels, how well it's made, how durable it is. And the most scientific you got was comparing the advertised weight to the actual weight. But now several channels are all about scientifically testing the new pieces of kit as they come out. How fast can a stoil... <laughs> How fast can a stove or fuel boil water? How long will fire starting material burn? And how much heat does a candle stove produce? The possibilities for testing are endless and non-biased testing should be done more often with results readily available to the consumer. So I applaud this crowd for trying. And while I believe they believe they are legitimately trying to add value to the conversation, their methods often are not as scientific as they think. In a boiling water test, for example, uh, they don't control against convective heat loss or changes in wind by providing a windscreen around the burner. In a burn duration test, they may not control for moisture in the surface upon which the material is burning, and that would cause the subsequent materials to burn longer because the first material spent its energy drying out the stump being used as the testing surface. And in nearly every case, they don't do repeat tests. How can results be considered scientific when they don't test for repeatability? Heck, even doing three burn tests and calculating the average is better than calling the matter closed after one trial. That said, there are a handful of channels that perform controlled and value-added testing. I've seen lab quality testing done on portable solar panels and battery packs and rock climbing gear, but those authors almost always have a background in STEM, usually engineering, and sometimes that's even their day job. And you can definitely tell the difference. The second example is the guy who collects a lot of data, but doesn't really know how to take full advantage of it. There's a, a particular Disney vlog, vlogger who routinely talks about his love for the science of Disneyland. And it typically involves observing crowd flow and establishing ben benchmarks and ride cues, i.e. if the line is backed up to point X, then the wait time will typically be 25 minutes. That's all great and helpful observations to note and publish. But he also studies wait times by going on the ride a bunch of times, noting the posted waste wait time at the start, and comparing it to the actual wait time. Again, these, are, these observations are great. It's helpful to know if Big Thunder Mountain wait times are typically overestimated by 12 minutes. But an abundance of data does not equate to science if you don't apply the correct statistical analysis. For example, why did he determine 30 runs was a statistically relevant number of tests? Could he have reached the same conclusion using 15? Or should he have done 60? He never explains his reasoning. And why use the mean of the wait times instead of the median? Mean is the average which is found by adding together all of the results and dividing by the number of values in the data set. The median is found by putting the values in ascending order and locating the middle value. Both return a value somewhere in the middle of the data set, but they can be very different values and are applied in different use cases. Most references will tell you to use mean when you have a normal distribution, which is also called a Gaussian distribution of data. Um, think of the, 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 the shape of a typical bell curve. That's a normal distribution. Conversely, median is applicable when the distribution is skewed with more values on one end of the range than the other. The median is also applicable when you have a wide spread of data with extremes at both ends of the set whereas the mean works better when the values are closer together. So let's say you have a five value set, just to make the math easy, of five, seven, seven, 18, and 30. The mean is 14 and the median is seven. Now, if you look at that data set, that 33 uh, is, is an outlier in the set. And if you remove it, the mean becomes 9.3 and the median stays at seven. However, you can't just throw out data just because. You need to justify the exclusion. Was it instrumentation error? Was it an external force at play which wasn't present in the other runs? In the case of this Disney vlogger, 
His data set produced a mean of 42 minutes, but the median was 30 minutes, a difference of 12 minutes or 30 some percent. Data ranged from five to 94 minutes with a total of 30 entries. Now, many factors that impact queue lengths in an amusement park are difficult, if not impossible to control for. So I think the vlogger is correct in not excluding any of the outliers. However, using the mean is not the optimal way to summarize this data set. He should use the median, if not a more complex analysis. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, is 12 minutes a big deal? Probably not. But if you're gonna advertise science, let's use the appropriate tools. And that brings us to the last example I want to discuss. People who should know better but still use science for clickbait. These are the science communicators on YouTube and other platforms. A few months ago, the channel Adam Savage's Tested published a video titled, Why is Apple's USB-C cable $130? The thumbnail I image is Adam holding up two cables side by side with text that reads $13 versus $130. Now, as a mechanical engineer, I assumed what I was about to watch was a side-by-side -side comparison of cables with different price points, but still meeting the same goals or requirements. Instead, what I watched was a video sponsored by a company called LumaField, showcasing its scanning technology. They scanned the internal constructions of the following cables. The $130 Apple Thunderbolt 4 cable, an $11 Amazon Basics USB-C cable, a $5.50 generic USB-C cable, and a $3.90 generic USB-C cable. Comparing USB-C cables to any Thunderbolt cable, let alone Apple's, in an attempt to justify the latter's high price tag is disingenuous at best and total BS propaganda at worst. Thunderbolt and USB-C cables are not the same product at all. They're wildly different use cases. So of course the Thunderbolt cable is going to be better engineered and constructed. It needs to be able to meet a requirement spec well beyond the requirements of a basic USB-C cable. It would be more appropriate to have comparisons between less expensive Thunderbolt cables and Apple's or cheap USB-C cables to expensive USB-C cables. Now, lest you think I'm being needlessly picky, in the video's introduction, Adam himself says, quote, we have scans of Apple's cables and their imitators, unquote. Imitators implies that the USB-C and the Thunderbolt are going to be equivalent. They're not. That is simply deceitful. A USB-C cable is not a Thunderbolt imitator. They're not even apples to oranges in comparison. Why didn't they compare a $130 Apple Thunderbolt cable to a $70 Thunderbolt cable from Belkin or the $40 Thunderbolt cable from Anchor? I see both on Amazon as I'm writing this. That would have been an honest comparison. Instead, we got a 22-minute video of three guys ogling the, desi the design and solder joints of an Apple Thunderbolt cable and justifying its price tag by showing how junky the cheap USB-C cables are in comparison. And more importantly, it's a 22-minute video of marketing the heck out of the LumaField scanners. That's a misuse of science and engineering, especially coming from a channel proud of its science communication. Fortunately, many of the video comments saw through the farce. Now, this episode isn't meant to dunk on these channels, at least not fully. It's meant to highlight that using science as a differentiator doesn't always make what's being discussed better or carry more weight. More and more, science and science communicators are being placed on pedestals. And as a result, we see science successfully used in marketing and propaganda. Because apparently, just like sex, science sells. Thank you for listening to this episode of the STEM Sessions podcast. It was researched, written, and produced by Cody Colborn. Show notes can be found at thestemsessions.com, and feedback and corrections are always welcome. If you received value from this episode and wish to give some back, please visit thestemsessions.com slash value for value for ways to support the podcast. 
And please remember, STEM belongs to everyone. We should not allow it to be siloed or gatekept by experts, policymakers, or talking heads. Bias is found in every message, so always verify what you read and what you're told. Until the next episode, stay curious.